Good day everyone! Here's an unplanned video which I made for you guys because essentially I found a problem after I changed the rear brakes on the Kia. If you'll take a look at that video you'll see that at the very end I basically used a bog standard kitchen thermometer with infrared to measure the temperatures of both rear discs and when I did that test immediately after changing the components everything seemed to be absolutely fine and for the sake of thoroughness I kept the thermometer with me for the next couple of days just to be absolutely sure that there were no issues about two days later I was just driving normally on a B road and after driving for a number of kilometers what I noticed was pretty much this here is the rear right wheel normal braking it's about 47 46 degrees centigrade and then I went over to measure the temperature on the rear left. And uh oh, that's like 80 degrees, 90 degrees at times. So a pretty hefty difference. 90 degrees on one side and about 47, 46 degrees on the other. And that got me worried. So I went home, I let the car cool down and then uh, took it out for another test drive and uh, unfortunately the problem kept manifesting and that pretty much told me that uh, I had a problem with the brakes on the rear left wheel and this is what I got when I got home rear right about 60 degrees rear left about 74 going up to 80 and so on so clearly a difference and because I already have experience with a overheated rear brake disc on the Range Rover this is obviously a problem that I won't just uh, ignore I'm not gonna make any initial assumptions I'll just start investigating the issue and I'm curious to figure out what the culprit is. Now, obviously you already know what the culprit is from the video description, but at the time of filming, uh, I did not. So stick around cause uh, this is probably gonna end up being a very interesting video. We begin with the safety stuff first. So on the rear left wheel, we have both a jack as well as a jack stand. And at the front, I've choked the wheels because obviously the handbrake is going to be off. And immediately, looking at the color of the disc, you can see at the bottom there's some discoloration from the overheating. Because if you take a look on the right hand side, which doesn't have any problem, the color of the rotor is gray uniform. Now hopefully we'll fix the problem before it has a chance to overheat further and uh, I really do hope that uh, the disc and pads and brake shoes will still be usable. And with the wheel off, listen to this. Okay, so you can definitely hear the grinding and also I'm putting up some effort just to spin the entire hub and disc. Okay, so let's see what are our options at this point. Well, I can think of two main culprits for now. Number one, a problem between the rotor and the pads, the caliper, maybe the caliper piston or something like that. Number two, a problem between the rotor and the handbrake shoes inside. I'm gonna rule out problems with the wheel hub itself because when I was installing the new disc I did check the hub and the hub had minimal rolling resistance so the hub is fine. So how to decide between the two? Well let's just remove the entire caliper plus pads plus caliper bracket assembly using the two bolts at the back the one over there and the one further down 
14 millimeter hex. It's basically the same procedure that I did when actually installing the rear rotors. So what's the rationale behind this action? Well, it's pretty simple. If we remove the caliper and pads and everything and the resistance goes away, obviously the source of the problem has to do with the pads and caliper. However, if the resistance is still there, obviously the problem is between the rotor and the handbrake shoes. So let's get to it. I'll do the disassembly off camera and get back when I'm done. Okay, removed, and let's see what we've got. Trying to spin the disc. And take a look, it spins freely, almost freely. Just as it did when we first installed it. So, what does that mean? There's no problem between the parking brake shoes and the brake rotor itself. The adjustment was correct. The bedding in was also correct, so this part is all right, no need to disassemble any further. So then let's focus our attention on the caliper and pads. First quick check, let's see if the caliper actually slides well. And let's just take a look at what happens at the top and bottom when I press on it. Okay, so it does slide well which is expected since we've just recently greased up and cleaned up both pins. Let's now disassemble the caliper from the caliper bracket and move forward from there. Here are the parts. Now let's first take a look at the caliper bracket. So the two pins both work well. No issues there. Okay. And the pads slide very easily on the shims, both of them. See? Now, this in principle was expected because when we did change the rear brakes a while back, we made sure to grease and clean up the pins and the shims were also greased. So we know this is not part of the problem, which pretty much leaves us with one suspect, which is the caliper itself. And come to think of it, it kind of makes sense that it's the caliper. When uh, I had the problem with the Range Rover, where the rear left brake, funnily enough, so same brake was overheating i was also getting score marks on the disc but they weren't on the surface where the pads touched the disc but rather on this part where the parking brake shoes touched the disc so that was an indication the parking brake shoes were the culprit now here the scoring is on the surface of the disc which pretty much confirms that the problem has to do with the caliper because the pads, as I said earlier, are not stuck in any way. And looking at the caliper itself, it's, it, it seems to be in uh, not so good a shape. Okay, so the inside of the piston is pretty rusted. It's rusted worse than its counterpart on the right side, which I think is visible in the rear brake installation video. But also note something else. Take a look in here. And you see that the rubber is pinched. And on this side, it's pretty old and it's about to crack or it hasn't cracked already. So what does this mean? We have no idea when the pinching occurred, but through that pinch, it's highly likely that humidity, moisture, grime, etc., got in. And this usually leads to internal rust of the caliper or of the caliper piston which in both cases translate to either a difficulty in moving the piston or the piston getting stuck altogether. And I also seem to recall, though I didn't give it too much importance back, uh, back then, that I needed more force on the C-clamp to push this piston in than I needed on the right-hand side. And let's see one more thing. I've asked uh, my lady to help me out to press the brakes a couple of times to see how the piston behaves 
when brake force is applied. So let's see what happens. Go ahead and uh, press, please. Okay. One more time. Okay. Stop. Thank you. Look at that. Okay. Look at that. Okay. This is how the piston was, or I think it was even more expanded when we removed the old brakes because the pads were so thin. And this hole is so big that it's virtually guaranteed that stuff got in and uh, we have rust inside. Okay, so with that said, we need to now remove the caliper from the car and inspect it further. And we will start by disconnecting the brake fluid line from the caliper. Now this is held in place with one bolt, which is over here, which is a 12 mil hex. But before actually doing that, we need to consider that once we disconnect this bolt, the brake fluid from the line is just going to start dripping. And because this is among the lowest points in the car, given enough time, all brake fluid is going to get out from the car and get on the floor, which is pretty bad given its toxicity. So first things first, we need to clamp this hose to make sure no brake fluid drips. And the best way to do that is to use one of these plastic pliers, which are specifically designed for clamping hoses, in that they keep them shut, but they don't damage the hoses themselves. You can easily find a set of these at, I don't know, about 10 euros, give or take, and it's well worth the money. But if you don't have one of these, alternatively, you can just use a normal pair of pliers, but make sure to cover both heads with some uh, thicker cardboard or something, so that you don't have the metal itself clamping on the hose. With that done, let's disconnect the caliper. I've also put a jar underneath the connecting point to catch any dripping uh, fluid. Let's see. Okay. I slacken it off and I can remove it by hand. Though strongly recommend you wear a pair of gloves at this point. There should only be very little brake fluid if the clamping of the hose has been done properly. So let's see what we get. Okay. You wanna keep track of this banjo bolt. Don't throw it away because we'll be reusing it. And then gently pull the cable out. As you can see, there's very little fluid dripping, so it means that we've tightened the hose well. We're just gonna leave it here. You can secure it if you want. Now this procedure should be done ideally with the caliper in its place, so you can apply proper leverage to the banjo bolt. And once that is done, simply remove the caliper from its two sliding pins. Exactly the same procedure that I used when I changed the rear discs. So I will do that off camera. One bolt is out. Here's the second one out. You can hold on to the caliper at this point to make sure it doesn't fall, but mine is secure. And then just gently pull it out. You can leave the pads there, no problem. And here it is in all its ugly splendor. Now I want to point out an important detail. Looking at the banjo bolt, you see it has one copper crush washer on it. But note there's also a second one, which in our case is actually still on the caliper. Now we're going to discard these and install new ones. But in any case, make sure if you are installing new ones, not to leave the old ones in place. Right, because otherwise you do a double gasket and you might get leaks. Okay, with this removed, now I just want to do a thorough cleaning of the exterior first and foremost. And I'm going to do that while the piston is still in so that most of the dust from the cleaning is not going to get inside the piston chamber. The cleaning is pretty much the same way that I did with the wheel hub when I installed the rotors. 
So you can check that out in detail in the brake installation video. Here is the caliper after cleaning up. And now the next step is to physically remove the caliper piston and the two rubber gaskets, which may be a tricky procedure. It can be done in multiple ways. One is to try and use a force of compressed air and just shove it in where the brake fluid would no normally come in. Alternatively, you can use a big pair of pliers and uh, grab the piston and just pull on it. And the third way would be to use some kind of chisel, a wider chisel that can fit through this hole. And with a hammer, just beat the chisel and that's supposed to beat on the piston until it comes out. Funny enough, if you can see in there, it says 34, which is the actual diameter of the cylinder for this caliper in millimeters. Now, personally, I'm going to try the compressed air method. So I have uh, placed the caliper in a vise. And usually you put a block of wood here because when the piston comes out, it comes out in quite a lot of force and you don't really want it to hit metal. And let's see what we get. Just put this here. And if you take a look, and it appears uh, this method has only taken us so far because the rubber is busted. I seem to be losing pressure through those holes. So no point in continuing like this. I'm not making any more progress. So I'm gonna switch to a pair of pliers, big pliers, and just start pulling it side to side and upwards slowly until eventually it comes out. And the pliers also worked well up to a point when I was getting increasingly hard resistance. So I ended up using the third method, which was a big hammer and a chisel or an equivalent. Just take a look at what it did to the nose of the thing. But anyways, I managed to beat it from here. And after a while, the piston came out. So let's check the state of the piston. We don't mind having scratched it all the way because we're going to replace it anyways. Let's see how it looks like. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's pretty rusty. And down here as well. Yeah. So clearly this is a clear indication that this was due replacing. And now we should also be able to remove this old anti-dust seal, which I just removed by hand. Look at its state. So clearly there was rust inside. And now if you take a look inside the caliper itself, you see this black line here. This is the part which typically fails every time a caliper piston gets stuck. This rubber o-ring here its section is squared, if I'm not mistaken. And basically what this part does, it does two things. Number one, it seals the inside of the caliper from the outside so that brake fluid doesn't come out. And it also acts as a return spring for the piston. Whenever you release the brake pedal and the piston has to go back just a little bit to uh, release the pressure on the uh, pads. And what usually happens is when the piston itself rusts or gets damaged. It also damages this rubber to the point where it either no longer seals properly and then water humidity gets in and accelerates the rust or it simply no longer fulfills its piston return function, which I think is part of what's happened here. So we need to remove that rubber as well. And here it is removed. You see what I mean? It's uh, section is a square. So this is the main culprit. And at this point, we're ready to start the rebuild, which as always is going to start with a very, very, very 
thorough cleaning of the inside of the caliper. All the rust or the dust needs to get out. Make liberal use of brake cleaner, compressed air and so on until it's absolutely shining. I'll go and do that uh, off camera and come back when I'm done. About one hour later and quite a lot of work. This is how it turned out. I managed pretty much to reach every crevice, every part where one of the gaskets has to sit. It was pretty rusty, but it looks fairly all right now. And to get all this done, my main tool was a Dremel with any kind of number of heads from brushes to metal brushes to polishing heads thicker or thinner as well as some finer grain sandpaper this was a 240 and it was pretty good but you can try even finer grain if you want but ultimately i'm pretty pretty happy with the results so now let's move on to installing new parts and here's what we have for the repair part we have the cleaned up caliper we have the new parts which are original equipment this is the inner seal this is the outer seal to protect from dust this is the new piston right here we also have brake fluid this is exactly the same brake fluid that the car is currently using now i changed the brake fluid on the kia about a year ago unfortunately i didn't uh, film the procedure but it's pretty similar to what i've done on the range rover anyways i'm using ate tup 200 type 200 brake fluid dot four and we also have our old parts to make sure that the new parts are the correct size and specification also, I'm working on a rubber surface because I might spill brake fluid. We're going to be using brake fluid to lubricate the inner seal. And you really don't want that thing uh, to seep down into, I don't know, your working table, furniture, whatever. And right away, here's something interesting. Here's the new piston, also 34, obviously, and the new inner seal. And you see they make a very, very tight fit which is what you would expect from new parts, right? Brake fluid obviously is going to be on this side and then on this side it should always be clean. However, on the old piston, not sure if you can clearly see, but there are ever so slightly visible gaps between the rubber and the piston. And that explained why when we were trying to push the piston out with compressed air we were just losing pressure because a good part of it was actually flowing between the piston and the seal and i have lubricated the inner seal with brake fluid as explained and i have installed it in its place by hand no tools nothing sharp obviously just make sure after it's installed do a visual checkup that it's not twisted in any way See, in our case, it's perfectly fine. And now if you want, you can just do a real quick checkup, like grab your new piston and just see how well it slides in. It should slide in obviously with some resistance and it does in our case, so all is well. And just one mention regarding the use of brake fluid as a lubricant for this seal there are multiple approaches to lubricate these seals when you rebuild a caliper many people do use the same brake fluid that it's used in the car to lubricate the seal but there are others that use all manner of uh, greases special greases or whatnot now personally i'm of the opinion that you should always lubricate a seal or o-ring with exactly the same type of fluid that it's supposed to meet throughout its lifetime right so you want to lubricate o-rings for the oil pan with oil o-rings for the fuel filter with the same fuel and obviously in our case i've lubricated this seal with dot for brake fluid the same brake fluid that's already in the car i definitely don't like the idea 
in this particular case of using anything other than brake fluid because whatever grease you're applying is just going to contaminate the existing brake fluid with I don't know what kinds of results in the longer term. Now, with regards to installing the anti-dust seal, which is this one into the piston, what you want to do is you want to first identify in which direction is the seal supposed to pop out as the piston gets extended from braking. In our case, if you look at it like so, the rubber should go upwards, right? So like so when the piston is pushed, which means that you want to grab your new piston and first just slide the cover so that at the end it's very very close to the bottom and next you basically want to grab your caliper and your new piston and seal position the piston correctly and then gently make sure that this part this lowest part of the dust seal is properly inserted in its final position which is this hidden row over here ideally try to use either your fingers or some flat tools making sure that you don't pierce the rubber as you push it into position what i found easiest is actually to extend this rubber part a little bit below the piston and with a little bit of effort i managed to put it in position now i just need to push the piston ever so slightly until it goes flush against the inner seal like so and then i should be able to start pushing it a bit like so and see it's basically in position right now at this point what you want to do just gently pull on the outer rubber as best you can and do a visual checkup that everything is sitting flush but other than that the installation of the piston is pretty much done now back at the car with our newly refurbished caliper we want to now install it in its correct position so we have our two bolts we apply medium strength thread locker we put the caliper in position and secure it tighten the bolts as much as you can by hand And then lastly, torque them to spec, just as I've shown in the brake replacement video. That's one. That's two. Next, let's install the brake line. And for that, we take our banjo bolt, give it a very, very good clean, because remember this is used for two rolls. One is to actually hold the brake line in place, but the second one is to actually allow brake fluid to pass through. See, it has this hole here, and then this other one here. So it's very important that this thing is properly clean. Go ahead and use brake cleaner, not brake fluid as much as needed to make sure that the passage of the brake fluid is unobstructed. And what you do is you take your bolt, you take one of the two new crush washers and you put it over the bolt. You then take your brake line, you put the bolt through the brake line with the bolt's head being opposite the brake line's tip that you see here. Then you take your second crush washer put it over the bolt on the other side and then you need to tighten the bolt in its correct position making sure that the notch is inside the caliper and the tightening torque for this bolt is between uh, 
24.5 and 29.4 newton meters i've chosen about 28 28.5 and using my torque wrench and a crowfoot extension i am done the next part is to remove the clamp from the brake hose to allow brake fluid to reach the caliper However, obviously do note that at least in this part of the hose, you now have a big bubble of air. You may have even more if the clamp hasn't been properly tightened. So that makes it absolutely mandatory to bleed the brakes at least on this side as well. Now I would normally recommend at this point to maybe bleed the brakes in the entire system. But given that for this particular car, I have done that about a year ago. I think it's pretty safe for now to just properly bleed this side. So here is our setup, the 10 millimeter hex key is in place and we have our one-way valve and then the hose goes into a small jar. So let's just open the bleeder valve. Now that took a bit of effort. We did manage to remove that big bubble of air, so now it seems we're pretty good. Okay, you can stop. And as you can see, we have no more air bubbles. And just for the sake of excessive thoroughness, the torque for the bleeder screw is between 6.5 and about 12.7 newton meters, give or take. So I'm going to torque it down to 12 newton meters. Now, normally you wouldn't really need to do this. You, you can just memorize the position the bolt was in before opening it and that's it. But just for fun. That's it. Don't forget to put the protective cap back on. Awesome. Now all we need to do is put the wheel on and take it out for a spin. And moment of truth. Let's see, rear right, about 65, 67, 64, give or take. And rear left, very, very, very close to that value. Another check, a few kilometers down the road. Rear right is about 70, 71, 72. Rear left is close to 70. So very, very close values. So that's very good news. We no longer have that huge temperature difference that we saw before, which pretty much means that the problem is solved. And lastly, it's conclusion time. It's been about two weeks since I uh, rebuilt the caliper and the feedback that I got from my dad has actually been better than what I expected. He actually drove the car for a couple of hundred miles and the main thing he noticed was a clear reduction in fuel consumption. For a certain road trip where he usually averages about 8 liters per 100 kilometers, now he got about 7.4 in the same weather, same conditions, etc., etc. So that's nearly a 10% improvement, which is, I would say, very, very good. But it also means that for a good while now, the car has actually been driven with a dragging rear left brake. So it's very good that uh, I got the chance to do this repair. Regarding the cost part, I was actually able to purchase genuine parts, as I said earlier gaskets, piston, crush washers as well. And all of this cost just 33 euros, which is a very, very good price to pay. I was actually a bit disappointed before going down the OE road that I couldn't find good quality aftermarket parts. Everything that I found was very cheap and uh, internet feedback was not the best. Now, I don't really know how much it would have cost to rebuild the caliper at the Kia dealer, I know they actually did it for the rear right wheel about a year ago, give or take. But I know that the brand new caliper was about 270 euros, excluding 
the labor cost. A caliper rebuilt obviously would have been cheaper, but I don't uh, actually have a number. And with that said, thank you very much for watching. If you've liked this video, please consider subscribing. I would be very grateful. Have a lovely day and I will see you all next time. Take care and goodbye.